co-host of Collision, Sunil Sharma. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Sunil Sharma. Uh, I'm the managing director of Techstars in Toronto. Techstars is the worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed and I'm the co-host of Collision. There's about 500 of us uh, from Toronto here to engage you and bring you home with us to Toronto next year. Uh, today is the final day of breakout startups. Uh, every day we've been presenting breakouts to you in two parts. In the morning, uh, we've showcased the very best and brightest of the seed companies. And in the afternoon, we've been meeting more with more rapidly scaling growth companies. So will these be the startups that everyone will be talking about in 2019? We think so. Dozens of the world's startup investors also agree with us. Their stories have been absolutely incredible and we've reached the very final session of breakout startups in 2018. The founders uh, who've made it this way are all backstage and they're eager to show you what they've done and how they've done it. Their companies are really worth hearing about. There's a lot to cover and so let's get right to it. First up, we have Troiva, uh, Truva. Truva was founded in 2015 it's a curated marketplace for bricks and mortar independent shops selling unique homeware and lifestyle, lifestyle products. To fill you in, please welcome to the stage all the way from their headquarters in London, England, the CTO and co-founder, Alex Loizu. Hi everyone, thank you for having me in Lisbon today. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm Alex, I'm the co-founder of Truva, and today I want to talk to you a little bit more about what we do. So this is one of our shops, um, Object Style. Uh, it was founded in 2009 by Rachel and Alex in Manchester. Rachel has a background in fashion buying. Um, she spent a lot of time in PR, then created her own events company, and then at some point just went back to the roots, uh, created her own online blog initially to basically transmit her style um, and to communicate with people the independent brands that she was finding. Alex, her husband, was running her, his own online menswear brand. And then in 2009, they came together and they decided to launch this offline physical shop mainly to showcase their own curation, which is very distinctive. It's about uh, craftsmanship, it's about simplicity, um, and showcase that to the people around their area. Now, this is not an isolated case, right? There are thousands of independents out there, each of which has a distinctive style, has a distinctive way of thinking about design, who have a specific story they tell through their shops. These are master curators, these are experts that are constantly looking for those new independent brands that are up and coming, and every single product they choose, they test out in the offline space, in the harshest environment of the world, to do retail, which is the high street. Now, one thing that is important to bear in mind is that these are pretty much high-quality, wealthy inventory that is basically locked down into the offline space. So how can we open this up? How can we open this discovery and inspiration up to a global audience? Enter the shop. It's not loud music and hard selling and trying to force you to buy something. These are places where you come to basically get inspired to basically discover new independent brands, to discover these collections of products. And it's an important differentiation to what we see happening in most of the big chains. What we're trying to do at Truva is create this global community of independent shops and shoppers that are united by their passion for distinctive products. We want to provide access to a global audience so that you have a choice so that buying from independents is not a trade-off for good customer experience, so that we bring technology and economies of scale to a huge segment that currently is underserved and is basically just locked down 
into the offline space. That's what unites us as a team. This is what we believe in, bring this wealth back to the online space. And at this point, I just wanted to give a big shout out to my team. They're going through Christmas right now. It's kind of the final stretch. So if you want to find out more about us, check us out on Instagram. We are Truva. If you believe in what we believe, and if this sounds interesting, reach out. We always want to have great people joining our team. Thank you so much. So next, we have Ava. Ava is a patented multi-sensor bracelet, which allows women to precisely and conveniently predict fertile days. Let's hear more. Representing Ava, please welcome to the stage the president and co-founder, Leah Von Bitter. Hello. My name is Leah, I'm the co-founder at Ava. We are one of the leading and fastest growing women's health companies. We started in 2014, launched in 2016, and now we're around 100 people um, all around the world in our offices in the US, in Hong Kong, um, and in Europe. Our mission is to bring women's health to the 21st century. And we do that by empowering women with actionable, data-driven insights about their body, about their health across all different stages of their reproductive lives. But actually, I'd just like to have Shannon tell that story. If Shannon will talk to us. Less stress and uncertainty for Sarah was certainly a benefit for me. My name is Sarah. I live in Chicago, Illinois. My name is Josh Bach. And Sarah and I, we've been married just over two years now. I wanted to give myself the very best chance to get pregnant as quickly as possible. I'm kind of a type A person, I'm a huge planner, and so I wanted to do everything possible to conceive as quickly as possible so that we weren't trying for months and months on end, if possible. When I learned more about Ava, I realized I could use the bracelet and kind of get rid of all of that. So when we started trying, it actually only took one month and we were able to conceive right away. I personally couldn't be more excited about baby Annabelle joining all our other Ava babies all around the world. And I'm thrilled to say that by now, 50 users um, of Ava report their pregnancy each day. And we've already kind of seen what Ava is. Ava is a sensor bracelet that Sarah can wear during the night. It tracks different physiological parameters, such as breathing rate, HRV, and a few others. And we're using those 3 million data points together with our big data set, analyze it with our algorithms, and find out the underlying changes of hormones during her menstrual cycle. All of that is conveniently communicated to her via the app, where she can look at, at the moment uh, in the morning and find out where am I in my cycle, when am I going to be fertile, when can I try to really exceed my chances. But Ava is also a platform. We have a large amount of educational content also for healthcare providers. We have other content for Sarah and her partner. And we offer community support and also support by fertility coaches. So what's in this for Sarah? Well, Ava provides her a new, much more accurate and easy method for her to track her menstrual cycle in real time. It gives her control and it doubles her chances to get pregnant each month. No more peeing on sticks, no more complicated cycle tracker, no more guesswork. And I said before that we want to change women's health for the better and bring it to the 21st century. The only way we can do that is with clinical research. Ava has conducted multiple clinical tests in the past. We have proven the accuracy of our device, but we are not done yet. We are continuing to do clinical research because in the end, we want to be able to help women across all stages of their reproductive life while they're trying to get pregnant or pregnant, trying to prevent pregnancy or in menopause. All of those stages are stages where women still don't have adequate solutions for their body. Those areas are underfunded, they're stigmatized, and we hope Ava will make a difference in all of them in the future. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Narvar. They are a customer experience platform that helps retailers inspire long-term customer loyalty at all steps of the post-purchase journey. 
Let's find out more. Please welcome to the stage Amit Sharma, founder of Narvar. Hello, everybody. My name is Amit Sharma. I'm the founder and CEO of Narvar. Uh, we pioneered the post-purchase customer experience category. So I would like to uh, highlight a one key difference between shopping in a store versus shopping online. When you shop, when you shop in a store, you walk in, uh, you look around, you see the products that you like. You t uh, when you like the product, you take it to the store manager, you give your money, you take uh, the product out, um, and the whole experience is complete. But when you shop online, you browse the products, you like what you like, and you put in your shopping cart, and when you're ready to uh, check out, you click the uh, order now button. However, you, know, you have given your money, but you haven't received the product yet. It might take a couple of days or more. And that's the key difference. Uh, there is the online purchase experience, and there's a big post-purchase experience. And that post-purchase is a big problem uh, in online shopping today, both for the consumers as well as for retailers. From consumers' perspective, you have given your money and you're waiting for your product. And that drives a lot of anxiety and questions for the consumers. Where is my item? When I'm going to receive it? And, and what's the next update that I can get from retailers? And from the retailers and for e-commerce companies, um, that drives a lot of customer uh, inquiries. In fact, almost 40% of customer service calls are in the post-purchase process. So that drives a lot of operational cost, as well as missed opportunity of really engaging customers in a meaningful fashion. And I worked at Walmart and Apple, and I saw this problem actually continues to grow bigger and bigger. And then that also creates, when you have a problem, a big opportunity to actually address uh, this issue. So I started Narvar almost five years ago uh, to address this, what we call the post-purchase customer experience category. And our mission is, how do you actually uh, build that trust and confidence for that consumers as they shop online? And that journey starts um, all the way when you place an order. And in the last five years, now we work with over 500 enterprise brands and retailers. Some of the most iconic companies such as Gap, Levi's, or Sephora are leveraging our platform um, in, in their online shopping experience. So let me walk you through some of the experiences here. So at the time of placing an order, how do we actually show the accurate delivery date when consumer can receive their goods? Not only that, but give them a very seamless way of tracking their items while they're waiting for it. Uh, sending proactive communication through email, SMS, or through social platforms such as Facebook Messenger to build that customer engagement during that waiting period. And not just at the delivery, uh, but beyond delivery in terms of returns and exchanges. How do you provide a seamless experience with the whole purpose of driving that loyalty so that customers can come back and shop with you again? And in these last five years, um, my experience has been that you know, there is a lot of friction point in terms of technology. How do we actually simplify everyday life of consumers? And from our side, using the post-purchase places to drive incredible experience is a big opportunity for all of us. Thank you. Happy Diwali, Amit. OK, now we have Visco. Visco is an art and technology company that empowers creative expression around the world. It's really taking off. Most of your smartphones have a Visco product. Visco is doing incredibly interesting uh, things in the space from their headquarters in the Bay Area. And to paint the full picture for you, please welcome co-founder and CEO, Joel Flory. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Joel Flory. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Visco. Um, and as I saw earlier in the week, Patty tweeted out a photo of center stage and the number of people out here. My daughters were looking over my phone and were like, oh my gosh, dad. 
And I was like, do you have any advice? One daughter told me to tell a joke, and the other said, no, dad, you're horrible at jokes. Um, the second said, don't worry, dad. The last conference we saw you speak at, no one paid attention. We saw them all on their phones. So <laughs> hopefully that's not the case. If you are, hopefully you're down downloading Visco. Um, so, but what is Visco? Um, hopefully many of you use it. I've been really enjoying my time here in Lisbon with uh, the people at the restaurant. They ate at last night, all used it. Um, but Visco is a photo app. We build creative tools in a community driven by self-expression. And our mission is to help everybody fall in love with their creativity. Uh, we believe this mission is important because we believe if we're successful at it, we'll help create a world in which creative differences are celebrated. So how are we doing? Um, a little, we launched in 2011. At first, we started with a workshop. We built desktop plugins. We moved to a paid app. Uh, then a free app with in-app purchases. And Q1 of last year, we launched a subscription. And for us, this was really important because as a mission-driven company, we were really focused on finding a business model that aligned with our mission. We've always believed in building something of value that people are willing to pay you for because we believe that can scale. And what we love about the subscription model is that it's something where people pay you, and then you have to continue to deliver value over a period of time so that they pay you again. Um, and we've seen great success with this. So since launch in Q1 of 2017, we've seen an average quarterly growth of over 136%. Q1 of 2018, we reached 1 million members. And excited to say in Q4 of this year, we've reached 2 million paying members. Now, this isn't just about the money that we're making. And for us, it never really is. That's not the focus. The focus is always the consumer. For us, everything in our business is driven around delivering value to the consumer. My founder, my co-founder and I were photographers and designers for 15 years, and we set out to build this business to build a relationship with the creatives, to continue to deliver something of value, to always be an active participant in the community. Um, and with that, there's really this insight. At Visco, we're guided by a series of guiding principles that determine what we do and a series of core values on how we do it. Um, and something that I wanted to share with you today is something I believe in very strongly, and I already mentioned it with regards to aligning your business model to your mission, and that is you have to do it right. If something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And this is something that I know sounds easy, and you're like, yeah, yeah. Um, but as a founder, as many of you are, and starting your own business, there are pressure from every angle to grow, 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 grow. Grow at all costs, do whatever it takes fail fast, move fast, and break things. Um, and there's a point, though, that once your business starts to get off ground, you realize if it's not in alignment, if your mission's not in alignment with your business model, the employees start to like, what are we building towards? They don't feel aligned to where you're going. And it becomes very difficult to scale it back. And so if you can, I highly encourage you to really focus on doing it right. Because when you do, when it works, when you find that product market fit, you have that vision for where you're going, you can move forward with confidence. So thank you for having me. Have a great day. All right, the next founder that we'll bring up represents a startup called Peak. Based in the Bay Area, Peak is a travel activities marketplace. So joining us uh, is a very close friend of Web Summit. Please welcome Rizwana Bashir from Peak. Hi there, I'm Rizwana, I'm the founder of Peak, uh, and we are a platform for activities. And what that means is that we can help you go zip lining, or go on a food tour, or find a rock climbing um, uh, class, or be able to go swimming with sharks. Um, it's a very large market at about $150 billion, but it's really fragmented with thousands of small businesses um, who are largely offline. So what we do is we provide um, two pieces to our platform. We have software and we have a marketplace. Um, so you know, on the software side, what, one of the things you guys might not recognize is that about 80% of tour operators in America and Europe don't have any form of online booking. They're relying on 
phone calls and pen and paper to run their whole business. And so what we do is we come in and we provide them with online booking capabilities for their website. We power payments. We do all of the resource management, um, all the scheduling, and, and, and everything to do with email and text reminders. And so we provide them with everything to move from manual work into doing everything digitally. Um, and so that is very, very powerful. And we have things like digital waivers um, and a whole host of tools that help them um, drive more revenue and to increase their operational effectiveness. Um, then on the other side, as a consumer, I'm sure you've had that situation where you're trying to find a fun thing to do for a family day out or a fun date, and it's incredibly hard. So what we do is we have a little quiz where you're able to let us know um, what, you're, what you like, um, and we can see that you're an adventure seeker or you're a foodie or you're both. Um, and we can actually give you ideas of great things to do that are personalized based on what you like. Um, and with that, we're able to give you activities that are real-time bookable um, with verified reviews and a best price guarantee. And so we bring these two things together um, in order to really enable this whole market coming online. Um, and what we're doing is very similar to what other companies have done um, with their playbooks. Um, for example, OpenTable did this with restaurants, Zillow did this with real estate, and MindBody's done it with fitness studios. And so it's a playbook that's really worked and allowed people to build very large businesses. Now, we've actually been doing really well with this model. So we now already have hundreds of millions of bookings, uh, of dollars of bookings in our platform. Um, and that means we've got over 10,000 activities that are bookable in real time in America. That's the largest selection everybody has. And because of that position, we are uniquely um, able to partner with companies like Yelp, Google, and Groupon, so that when you're on a Google search a page or a, a Yelp page, you can instantly book activities from Pete.com. Um, we've also collected over 700,000 reviews and ratings on the tours that we offer. And so those are all verified, and the average rating is 4.8 stars. So it's a really high quality um, group of activities. And the average business that's working with us actually increases their revenue on average by about 30%, uh, and they save a ton of time and money. Um, this has all really only been possible because we built a great team. We've raised about $40 million of capital from the founders of Google, Kayak, and Twitter. Um, we have an executive team that scaled very large businesses like this before um, with Google, Square, and Uber. And we have offices across three, three locations in the US, San Francisco, Utah, and New York. And we've really been driving to build the most innovative product in the market. Um, we've got lots of awards with that, and we're really excited about the, what the future is going to bring for us. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so in just a second, I'm going to call out Rafal Modruski. Rafal is the is representing ISI, and from their headquarters in Finland, ISI empowers others to make better decisions in B2B and B2G, B2 government industries, providing access to timely and reliable satellite imagery. So we'll let Rafal explain more. Please welcome Rafal Modruski. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, exciting to be here. Um, my name is Rafael, and I'm from MySci. I'm one of the founders and the CEO. And I would like to share with you our vision, uh, where we are, and uh, there is a little bit about what's next. Um, so let me start with the vision. So the idea of the company is to bring information that around, that's around you, that's all around the whole globe, and we would like to bring it to you very often. I know that it sounds a little bit vague, but I will try to walk you through a set of steps that will help you understand what exactly we are doing. So first and foremost, we build small satellites. This is a, a video that shows a construction of a micro, small, uh, micro synthetic aperture radar satellite. It's a specific satellite it can see through darkness and it can see through clouds. And it takes images from space that then we can download and show you what's happening on those images. The exciting thing about this satellite is that it's very small and low cost. Because it's so low cost, we can take a lot of them and launch them in a constellation. This is actually a visualization of a constellation of 18 of those satellites. And because there are so many, we can revisit any particular location every hour, which means that it can take picture of that location every hour. And we're going to see what's happening over there, regardless of weather condition or time of day. And so the next thing that we do with it, this is actually one of the pictures that we've taken 
is we try to extract information out of that picture. This is a synthetic aperture reader frame worked on with machine learning methods. We tried to count objects. We would count vessels. We would uh, define where the trees are, where water is. We would be able to define uh, sea patterns. Uh, we can measure ocean currents. We can actually virtually measure anything that's visible on that picture. And then we combine this information. We ask you, where do you want your data to be coming from? We take them from all around the world. We merge it together. And we provide you that information stream that comes to you on hourly basis. So um, the company started itself in 2012. It was a university project at first. Uh, then we founded it in 2015. We've gone through seed A, B. And um, I'm happy to say that January this year, we've gone through the most important milestone, and we've uh, launched our first satellite, ISA-X1. This is an uh, um, Indian launch vehicle. And this is the satellite. And it was really exciting for us because it was actually the first ever micro synthetic aperture satellite to be launched. And it worked. And uh, what we did is we decided to scale. So after this, this first successful milestone, I wanted to invite you all to be part of our journey and actually go to ISI Careers and check out what we can offer, because we do need more people to do what we are doing. And now I wanted to take the opportunity that I'm here with you and this is exciting crown and make an announcement about our next biggest milestones. So let's check it out. Thank you, guys. I am uh, happy to announce that after 10 months of work, we've, uh, we've learned so much from ISAX-1. And now we are going through our next biggest thing, which is launching of ISAX-2. It actually is going up in 11 days on uh, Falcon 9, launched from California. And it's an even more sophisticated, even better satellite. And it's going to bring more information about what's happening around the world. And it's uh, <laughs> my pleasure to be here. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. That was wild. Uh, all right, next to the stage is 10X. So this company is headquartered in Singapore, and they make you able to spend cryptocurrency spendable anytime, any place, anywhere in the world. To tell us more, please welcome co-founder and president of 10X, Julian Hosp. In 2014, I learned about a topic that I'm sure many of you have heard over the past years and probably also at this conference, namely Bitcoin. Back then, I was a medical doctor, so I had a no bullshit approach, hands down. And my very first question was, what or how can I actually use Bitcoin, these digital currencies? I mean, they all exist in this virtual world. And there's not only Bitcoin, there's many other digital tokens. How can we use those? So in 2015, together with three of our co-founders, we started a company called 10X, where it was our idea, let's connect those virtual currencies with a debit card and let people spend, well, Bitcoin, Ethereum, but in the future also digital tokens that could be real estate, could be stocks, could be gold, literally anything online, offline, all around the world. Today, we have close to 90 people working for us. We have close to $90 million in funding, the business has really been booming, and we've been growing all over the world. And instead of me just explaining it to you how this works, maybe let me quickly show you how easy it is. You download the app, you order the card, and uh, well, off you go and you spend your cryptocurrency. So let's Hi, see Alvin. From 10X, I've got my card here. I'm just going to go down now and buy a cup of coffee. So as you can see from the app, I don't have to do any pre-conversion of my cryptocurrency to fiat. All I have to do is set my primary currency. I'll be making this transaction with Ethereum, so I'll set that as primary. Let's go. Hello, can I have one big day to take away, please? There you go. Thank you. Yes. 240. 
taken from my Ethereum balance. So there you go, one day to take away, paid for with Ethereum on my 10x card. Yeah, so you can see that you saw the fiat balance, in this case in Singapore dollars, come in. Alvin then got deducted some Ethereum because he picked Ether as his primary currency. And going forward, we see a lot of different options working there. Now, one thing that we know is that probably cards are not going to be the future of transactions. And so one thing we have started working on is a system called Comet. And Comet is going to be open source. We're actually going to open source it this year. And it might be very interesting for many of you, especially if you are in blockchain. Because with these tools and libraries, it will allow you to connect your blockchain to any other blockchain. And hopefully over the next years, and it might take a decade or two, we're going to be able to actually build a network of blockchains, thereby disrupting trust in a completely new way. Maybe similar how the internet disrupted information by connecting intranets. So with this, I really want to say thank you for being here. If you want to find out more, a couple of things, um, you can download our app 10x. It's on iOS and on Android. You can order our card from there. If you are quite tech savvy, check out Comet.network. You can find everything out about Comet. If you're completely new to this, we have a lot of free stuff out there on blockchain and cryptocurrencies, also a couple of books that you can find. Um, it was a pleasure. Get crypto fit. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you. Oh. Very well done. So in just a second, I'm going to call out Edward Tang from Avagant. Now, Avagant is developing next generation display technology to enable previously impossible augmented reality experiences. So to tell us more, please hello, say hello to Edward. Thanks, everyone. I'm Ed from Avagant. And for the last 10 years, we've experienced this incredible computing revolution. All of us now carry smartphones in our pockets. This was what happened in the last decade. And it's really enabled all sorts of new applications and new industries. But what if I told you in 10 years from now, we won't have smartphones anymore? Because we're about to enter the next revolution of computing, and that's augmented reality. Once we're, once we're able to enable these type of thin, high-performance glasses that we can wear, the world becomes our computing surface. We can vir enter virtual worlds. We can add virtual objects all around us every day. And this is going to enable all sorts of new exciting applications that we can't even imagine yet, just like what a smartphone did 10 years ago. At Avagant, we create the display technology that's going to enable this computing revolution the display technologies that are going to allow us to build these incredibly sleek, slim, high-performance wearable displays. And we're so excited to introduce some of these technologies to you. So there's two things that I want to introduce to you. A couple of years ago, we actually made the world's first retinal projection system, where we're using low-power LEDs and millions of microscopic mirrors on a chip to project images directly into your retina. And it sounds a little bit scary, but the result is incredible. We're getting pixel perfect images. You can't see any pixelation, super high resolution, super high fidelity, and small compact form factors. This is the first retinal projection display ever shipped out in mass production into the consumer market. Since then, we've taken these display technologies and we've actually built transparent displays. And we've solved one critical problem for the augmented reality market, and that's a display technology that's called light field technology. Now, what light field technology does is it allows us to display images at multiple focal distances in the real world, truly replicating how our eyes see. When I look up close, things are nice and clear. At the same time, things far away go out of focus, and I can very naturally change my focus point, so things feel so realistic to me. And we're able to do real-world overlay, take virtual objects and put them on top of the real world and enable things like interaction. For example, if I wanted to hold an object in my hand, this virtual object, this object actually looks like it's in my hand. The focus of that object feels like it's in my hand. And simultaneously, I can put things farther away, and my eyes can naturally gaze 
closer and farther away, just like, these, just like the real world. And these objects feel hyper-realistic. And there's so many new applications that people are excited about, especially in the consumer market. And one I wanted to show you is a new computing interface coupled with virtual telepresence. This is something that a lot of people are very excited about. No longer do I have a touch screen. Now I can have interfaces up close that I can touch and feel much more intuitive than a traditional computer or even a phone, and have a virtual telepresence, actually see someone in the room with me. These are the type of experiences, just one of dozens of experiences, that the industry is incredibly excited about. And we're excited that our display technology is going to power the next generation of consumer AR and the next generation of computing. Thank you. Thanks. Incredible. Incredible. OK, next, get ready to learn about standard cognition. So our next speaker uh, and, uh, and has a full team in New York City, and they're doing such cool things in creating artificial intelligence that allows buyers to grab what they want without having to go to a cashier. To hear about it, let's introduce Jordan Fisher, the co-founder and CEO of Standard Cognition. Hello, I'm super excited to be here and I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about what we're building. But before I do, I want to tell you about something that actually really sucks. Uh, and that's waiting in lines. So collectively, as humans, we spend over 10 billion hours a year waiting in lines. That really sucks. Uh, in fact, we don't just wait in lines, we spend hundreds of billions of dollars to maintain these lines. It's a massive, massive drain on our economy and honestly on our psyche. I, I really just hate waiting in lines. So how do, we, how do we do better than that? How do we take this awful problem and solve it? We're developing a solution that we call autonomous checkout. And the whole goal is to remove this awfulness. Let's reclaim those tens of billions of hours. Let's have this massive windfall for humanity. And let's really just touch us every Day. We all shop every day. Let's make that better. So how do, how do we do that? It's, it's really all based on machine vision. And I, I could spend days telling you about how awesome the technology is from a business perspective, how it's going to change the face of retail. Uh, but what I really want to do is tell you about the technology and how it works. So it's, it's all vision-based. It's all camera-based. And what I'm going to show you up here is what the system actually sees. So these could be cameras inside of a store. They're cameras overhead, and they're just watching. And this is what the system is seeing in real time. This is what it's understanding in real time. And there's a tremendous amount of things that it needs to understand in order to be able to figure out what you have. So that when you leave the store, we can just charge you automatically. You don't need to wait. You don't need to scan anything. It's just a seamless, amazing, friction-free experience. So I just want to tell you, you know, a few of the really hard problems here. One of them is pretty obvious. We need to be able to recognize what people are holding. That's actually really hard, uh, especially from an overhead camera. It's too expensive to put RFID on every item or to put sensors in, in the shelves so that you can see what's happening as it's removed. It's, it's too expensive. So we have to do everything from overhead cameras. And just looking from 20 feet away, is that Heinz ketchup or is it mustard? What, what is it? This is a really hard problem. But that's actually the easiest of the problems that we have to solve. An even harder problem is what we call visual tracking. So what you'll see is two people right now, and they're color coded. And that's denoting that the system is able to understand which person is which. And it's doing that fully anonymously. So there's no facial recognition. It's just understanding that these are unique people and following them through space and time. It's, it's a really challenging problem. And then, of course, there's this even harder problem of action recognition. What are you doing? Did you take something? So that when you get to a kiosk, we know exactly what you have, or when you walk out of the store. So that, that's the tech side. Real fast, this is what it actually looks like. Uh, this is our store that we just opened in San Francisco. Uh, we're partnering with lots of major retailers. We're not trying to be a retailer ourselves, but this is our pilot store to kind of show it working. And what happens is you walk into the store, you shop however you want to shop, take items, put them into your purse, put them into your jacket, whatever you want to do, and then when you walk out of the store, we will automatically bill you. That's it. 
no more work, no more friction. You just get a nice notification on your phone letting you know, hey, this is what you just spent. That's it. Walk out. Uh, so that's, that's it. That's the technology. I want to just wrap up and say we're really excited about what we're building, uh, but there are a ton of really, really hard problems. We generate petabytes of data. We have to stream process it in real time. It's really hard machine learning, really hard infrastructure and tooling. Uh, and if that's the kind of stuff that excites you, I would love to talk to you. Our team would love to talk to you. Shoot me a message, uh, and we can talk some more. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> that's good. Well, that wraps it up. Those were amazing companies. A huge round of applause for this year's growth stage breakout startups. Wild. We're going to do it again next year and at Collision. Uh, but in the meantime, we, we just hope that you really enjoyed seeing what we think are the best companies in the world and really can only be brought to you by other, only by Web Summit and, and our related events around the world. They're just remarkable companies. So we want you to hold your seats. Uh, because we're going to be bringing now a, a fantastic roster of afternoon sessions with the likes of the founders of Limebike, uh, Tommy Hilfiger, Eb Williams, and the um, unveiling of our pitch final winner and our closing session of 2018 Web Summit. So right away, I'm going to uh, tell you about a world that's filled with fake news, social is isolation, and trolls. Does social media really bring us any happiness? Up next, the CEO of Imgur will outline how you can create an uplifting experience on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Schaff. Well, it's safe to say that this has been a tough year for the internet. We've seen more fake news, data leaks, and hacks than ever before. And now, people are finally starting to do something about it. It's safe to say that the internet and social media is just starting to bring us down. But it wasn't always like that. I remember an internet that you used to dial into, and you'd surf the World Wide Web. And yeah, we may have only been seeing uh, GeoCity sites and hanging out in chat rooms, but still, somehow it felt like the future. Now today, things have really ramped up. With Web 2.0, the internet got an upgrade. We now sleep with our phones under our pillow, and we live with this constant anxiety about our battery dying. The internet is no longer this thing that we surf after school or after work. It's where we are studying and what we are working on. But now we're beginning to understand that this thing that we've built is starting to cause us some problems. Designers have come out against the products that they've built. Foreign actors are manipulating our technology to swing elections. And we can hardly tell the difference between fake news and real news. And what's also becoming clear is that the largest companies online are in the business of monopolizing our attention at the expense of our well-being. So we see that young people are starting to just delete the Facebook app from their phone altogether. They're also locking down their privacy settings. They're spending less time on social media. And they're taking breaks of up to several weeks or more. And the thing is, though, that 
the fact that social media is making us feel bad about ourselves and about others, it's not even hardly news anymore. In fact, it's starting to enter popular culture. We see that there are movies with entire plots written about this. There are TV shows with episodes on it. And of course, celebrities are tweeting about it. We even have the inventor of the internet himself here at Web Summit, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, talking about how he's been disappointed in the direction that the internet has been taking. You see, people don't usually share their high... People only share their highlight moments on social media, and they censor out anything even remotely negative or real. So this leads to a warped perception of how we see one another. It causes us to envy each other. And it makes it seem as if everyone else is happier and more successful than you are. But it's hard to share the real you online when the game is to project the ideal you, because that's how you get the likes. And so, when I first observed this cultural shift, it really concerned me, because the company that I founded and run has been a part of the fabric of the internet for quite some time, and I honestly wondered if Imager was part of this problem. So, if you're not familiar with it, Imager is the world's largest community-powered entertainment destination. We see over 250 million people every month, and we're in the top 20 websites in the United States. And so, our vision is to lift the world's spirits for just a few moments every day, and so I needed to know the impact that we were having on this issue. So I commissioned a study done by a third-party company called Ypulse. They're a youth culture research firm located in New York, and they put together a nationally representative sample of so social media users aged between 13 and 35. And they evaluated all of the top social media companies that you see here. First, what they found is that social media is a breeding ground of negativity. In fact, two-thirds of social media users wish that social media was a more positive place. And the more social media platforms you use, the worse you feel. They found that Facebook users reported the lowest levels of positivity and feeling at ease. Instagram users reported feeling anxious, lonely, and depressed. And Twitter users felt the worst about the state of the world. So while we looked at how these platforms are making people feel, we also looked at what people use these platforms for and what they do. And people use these platforms to see what others are up to and to share what they themselves are up to. And so given the core functionality of these products and what they do, paired with just how bad they're making us feel, we can draw the conclusion that using social media to replicate and replace social interaction is making us feel worse. And then, to the surprise of no one, Ypulse also found that users largely regarded social media as a waste of time. But there are platforms that make people feel better, and there are platforms that people think is time well spent. And these platforms tended to be entertainment platforms that let you discover new things and, and have fun. And so they found that platforms such as Imager, YouTube, and Netflix actually do make people feel better after using them, not worse. So overall, Ypulse found that these platforms that are entertainment, that allow you to discover new content, offer a perfect antidote to social media's toxicity. 
And one, one aspect of all of these entertainment platforms is that they let you discover content outside of your friends group or not celebrities. And they let you discover new content. And so I thought I'd take this moment to share a story that you probably haven't heard before from one of our users across the world. This is Miss Filipina. And she is 25 years old, and she's from the Philippines. She created a post and shared a story on Imager about how in her village they offer a feel free meal program for needy local children Monday through Saturday. However, there are no options available for Sunday. So she decided to do something about it. She grabbed her mom, a friend, and a big pot of this chocolate-based porridge called Kemprado and created a meal program on the day that it was needed the most. When Imagerian saw this story, they immediately asked how they could help. And when she responded, it takes only 10 to $12 to feed all of the kids in the village. What happened next was a fantastic display of generosity and community as people all around the world started donating to her so that she could keep the meal program running. Within just one day, she received enough money to keep the program running for the next eight months. And on top of that, she was able to afford more nutritious options as well. And so last Sunday was her 23rd Sunday in a row running this meal program. And she posted a, another post thanking the Imager community for all of their generosity and support, who continue to support her for this day. But users aren't the only ones trying to bring positivity back into the world and back into the internet. We see that brands are doing it too. And so we've partnered with Mike's Hard Lemonade uh, to um, actually create an action on Imager, and the more users use this action, the more they donate to a wildlife conservation fund. So the first time they, we did this, they ended up donating over $30,000 uh, to a giraffe conservation fund. Hi, everyone. A huge thank you to Imager and Mike's Hard Lemonade for the amazing support for World Giraffe Day. Almost $30,000 US dollars raised is going to help these guys out here better be able to be safe in the wild. So we're going up to Uganda soon. With all the support, we're going to be moving giraffe across from the Murchison Falls National Park to Kadepo Valley. Exciting times ahead. Thanks very much, and please keep watching us, and thanks again for helping us save giraffe in the wild. And they're not the only ones who are trying to uh, have brand values around positivity. We see that there are other companies such as Lyft, Zappos, Warby Parker, and Tom Shoes who all have brand values around this because Ypulse found one more thing, and that's that being in a good mood makes you much more likely uh, to be, uh, to <laughs> being in a good mood makes you much more uh, receptive to everything, including advertising. And so, in summary, we see that platforms that focus on entertainment and discovery offer this perfect antidote to social media's toxicity, and that positivity is just plain good for business, too. And so, if you'd like to hear more about this study, uh, then please feel free to reach out to us at hello at imager.com, and we can share the entire thing with you. And now I hope everyone here leaves feeling great, because I know that together we can make the internet positive once again. Thank you very much.